I read a book about a year ago that had a significant impact on me. Uh, it pointed out some things in my life that had snuck up on me and, and, and I didn't see it coming. And uh, the book is called that. It's called I D Didn't See It Coming, uh, Overcoming Seven Greatest Challenges That No One Expects and Everyone Experiences. And uh, I'm not going to, in the next few weeks, cover any of the material from this book or the content of the book, but I'm going to jump off of that and dive into Scripture along some of the same kind of things that he looks at. In the book here, he deals with things like cynicism and compromise and disconnection, irrelevance, pride, burnout, emptiness, uh, things that are pretty common in our world, and they sneak up on us. Um, Things like cynicism that we're going to look at today. The way of Jesus is hope. Not cynicism and pessimism and grumbling. We'll look in a couple of weeks at irrelevance. And that's one that caught my mind because I, I think all of us at life at some point in our lives, we're on the cutting edge of what's new and exciting and we're uh, involved and we have a voice and we're informed, and, and, and as we grow older, the world changes, and all of a sudden, I'm kind of feeling left out of it, behind, uh, and irrelevant. And I think all of these things are things that are very real in our world and in our culture, probably in our lives, and you don't see it coming. And so we want to look at that over the next few weeks. Today, we're going to look at cynicism versus hope. Now, before we get there, uh, we are going to use our Bibles this morning, so pull them out. If that's on your phone, that's fine. If you've got your, your paper Bible with you, awesome. If you need one, there's lots at the back. Feel free to jump up and grab one. Uh, but I want to look at uh, cynicism and hope. Let me ask this first. Uh, hi hidden behind all the trees out front, there is a sign that says Sabo Christian Fellowship, and there is a slogan written underneath that or a motto. What does that say? A beacon of hope on Lake Huron. A beacon of hope. What does that actually look like? What does it actually mean to be a beacon of hope? Now the clearest picture, I guess, is the lighthouse. And that's been part of our, our logo and our design all the way along. Uh, and the lighthouse, the two aspects, right? And if you're in danger out in sea, the lighthouse tells you where safety is and there's hope immediately. But if you're uh, navigating rough waters and rocky waters, the lighthouse also tells you where the danger is. But I wonder how many churches, though, their heart is to be a lighthouse, but they're actually just maybe more like a restaurant. Where people come and have a coffee and hang out and maybe watch the game, or they come and grab a meal and then go back home to their own lives. We live in a time in history when hope has pulled the disappearing act. And um, I want us to think about that. This is the first time in North American history where people as a whole really don't think that the future is going to be better than the way it was. I, I, I can't think of any other time in history when it's been like that. Across the board, there's the economy and politics and the environment and education. There's so much hurt and anxiety. Uh, we approach everything guarded and apathetic and fearful. We make way too many decisions based out of fear. I want to just be a kid again. The kids look at the things wide-eyed and hopeful and optimistic. Am I right? Where is that gone? But I think our world shapes us into sluggish, apathetic, pessimistic, fearful, anxious, cynical. And we become that. I don't know about you, I don't want to be like that. And if you're like that, I don't want to hang around with you. But I think if we're honest with ourselves, there's far too often 
that I'm cynical. In a world like that, when there's a real beacon of hope, how spectacular is that? That stands out as something significantly different. Do you have a Bible? If you do, turn to 1 Thessalonians. That's the passage that, that Brad and Lynn read for us a little while ago. 1 Thessalonians. I want to look at chapter 1. Now, uh, the, the back story to this is in Acts chapter 17, where Paul and Silas uh, arrived in the, the Greek town of Thessalonica, and uh, they were only there about a month before hundreds of people were leaving the Greek mythology and the Greek gods and that whole culture and changing their allegiance to Jesus and follow Jesus. And they got into a lot of trouble for that. It caused all kinds of stuff. Um, but in the middle of their great persecution and struggle, they have an incredible hope that's talked about in the book of Acts. It's talked about here. It's talked about in Second Thessalonians. It's talked about in other places. Um, and, and in the middle of a very difficult political and religious landscape, they stood out and were known worldwide. Uh, the, the, it, the, 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 the difficult political landscape, the difficult religious landscape, actually worked to the advantage of God's kingdom in the church. Not against it at all. So look at, at this passage here. I may not read it all of it, but um, we read it a few minutes ago. Starting in verse 2, we always thank God for you, and we pray for you constantly. We pray to our God and Father about you, and we think of your, look at this, three things. Faithful work, your loving deeds, and your enduring hope. Those are three pretty great things. I think if I'm dead and gone and people think back on my life, if those are the three things I'm characterized by, I'm pretty happy with that. Your faithful work, your loving deeds, and your enduring hope. Verse 4 says your hope is, is based on God loves you and God chose you to be his people. It goes on to talk about how they so, so readily, quickly received the message. And in verse 6, talking about the severe suffering that they're experiencing. Life was not easy. Severe suffering, but enduring hope. In verse 7 and 8, it talks about how the whole world sees it and notices it and knows about it and is talking about it. In a world that's dark and difficult, their hope stands out. And the world is talking about it. I hold tightly to that today. As things in our country seem to get more and more difficult for Christians, just to live as Christians, I, you know, we really have nothing to complain about. In those days where there's a Roman soldier with a spear on every corner... When I see days get tougher for Christians, Christians then have to choose faithfulness. And we have to choose loving action. We have to choose to not go incognito. And the hope in Christ actually becomes more crystal clear to the people around us. That is good for God's kingdom. The church in Thessalonica was a great example of a beacon of hope in their world. And, and I saw this in Cuba. If you were here last week, I spent about five or ten minutes talking about our trip to Cuba uh, to visit a number of churches. And while we were there, uh, this is the kind of thing I saw in their churches. Now, now hear this. Um, the BIC, Brethren in Christ Church, was in Cuba before communism came. And so they're one of only a few churches that were allowed to stay registered through the communist era. And uh, so they're still there. Uh, it's still a communist country. It, lots of heavy-handed control. You see it everywhere. But when Russia pulled their finances out, communism remained, except now you add extreme poverty to the mix. And so these people there uh, clearly 
not an ideal situation for anybody, let alone Christians. But today, the church in Cuba, a bunch of churches in Cuba, are, are vibrant and alive in the midst of all of that. Yes, there's difficulty. There's political pressure and difficulty. There's economic difficulty. There's lots of control and a lack of freedom. And there's religious oppression and poverty. But God is doing something brand new in the middle of that. They have every reason to grumble. They have every reason to be afraid. But they're not. Why? Hope. Because of hope. And in Sanctus Spiritus, the church that we sponsor, that we partnership there, the whole neighborhood is seeing the change in people. The church meets in an apartment building, and it's in a neighborhood with about 30 of these apartment buildings, and there's nothing else there. The, the buildings are falling apart. It's very poor, and our church is in the middle of that. Look at verse 9. In verse 9 in our passage, it says, For they keep talking about the wonderful welcome you gave us. But look at this. They keep talking about how you turned away from idols and served the living and true God. They keep talking about the life change, the dramatic change they saw in you. And everybody notices. We saw that in Cuba. It's almost like like these people, um, it's like, Their eyes have been plucked out and replaced with eyes that only see the good. They're surrounded by all kinds of trouble, but they only see the hope and the positive and the optimism and what God is doing. Folks, that was the songs we were singing about this morning. Did you see that? That's what we saw in Cuba. And in Sanctus Spiritus, in this this community of uh, apartment building after apartment building after the most notorious well-known, hard, broken people are coming to Jesus. The prostitute, the thief, the guy that just got out of prison, and on and on, the anger, the rage. Those people are coming to Christ. Their lives are so dramatically changed that the, the entire area of all these apartment buildings notices, and they see the change in their lives, and they're taking notice, and they're curious. And guess what? As the neighborhood watches and the craziest, worst people dramatically change by Christ, guess what happens? Hope begins to float to the surface. You see that? They're welcoming and loving and sharing and passionate. They worship with all that they are. They're on mission for God every single day, all the time with energy and with passion and with risk. And each person, each person is a beacon of hope in their community. And can you imagine what it looks like when all of those people get together in one room? Folks, that's neighborhood changing, isn't it? That looks so much like this church in Thessalonica. The church in Cuba is filled with so much hope. Not because there's hope that communism might break and fall. Not because there's hope that poverty might be gone and the economy might get better. There's not hope because life might change and it might be easier for us. There's hope deep in their souls because of Jesus. They have something to live for and there's a future of love and joy and peace. And there's hope because people's lives are changing. Folks, maybe we need a little persecution. Maybe we need a little severe suffering. There's lots of people here who have gone through some severe suffering and I hear from you and some of you are saying, through this time of suffering, I drew so close to Jesus That he met me and and my relationship with him is so much richer and deeper. Some of you are saying that. Others are in the midst of really difficult things and you're becoming bitter and enraged and all you do is grumble. Do you see the difference? That's the difference I want to talk about. You know as well as I do. When we talk about God moving, God doing new things, when God does something brand new, there's only two responses from his people. Some get cynical and pessimistic and only see the hardship and the risk and the trouble, or maybe it's not going to work, 
The others are hopeful. They're the only two responses. Now, when we were in Cuba, Luis, do you remember Luis? If you were here last October, Luis was here and spoke to us. Luis is actually coming back in November and he's asked to come to our church. So he'll be here November 17th. You don't want to miss that week. Uh, while we traveled across Cuba, we went to different church after different church after different church. Luis was with us and he spoke in each of these churches. So we probably heard him speak, I, I don't even know how many times, we spoke the same message each time. And as he spoke, these are the things he said. Um, we, we heard variations, I'll come back to that, we, the variations of this sermon. And after hearing it over and over and over, we got to the place where we knew what he was saying even without a translator. But after hearing it so many times, I began to realize that, you know what? God is speaking this to me. And it took probably five times to hear that same sermon before I, I realized, get it through your thick skull. God is speaking to you. So I want to talk a little bit about the things that he said. Because at least five times we heard him talk about Moses leading the people of Israel out of Egypt across the wilderness. Here's what he said. If you have a I'll turn to Exodus chapter 13. I won't read lots here, but I want to look at 13, 14, 15, 16, uh, and chapters in Exodus. And most of you know this story if you've been around your Bibles. Moses leads the people out of 400 years of slavery with the 10 plagues. And, and uh, in chapter 13... uh, It says here in verse 21, The Lord went ahead of them. He guided them during the day with a pillar of cloud and provided light at night with a pillar of fire. He allowed them to travel day or by night. And the Lord did not remove the pillar of cloud or the pillar of fire from its place from the people. Can you imagine that here's this people... I don't know how big this crowd was. Let's say 250,000 people, probably way more than that. And as they moved en masse, God was visibly in front of them. They got up every morning and saw that the cloud was moving and they followed God. They decided every morning to get up and follow God. And here they are, in, here, and then in the next chapter, verse 19, and the angel of the Lord, they've run from Egypt. Egypt is bearing down on them. They're locked in here because the Red Sea's in front of them. And the angel of the Lord, who had been leading the people, moved to, um, to the rear of the camp. So instead of being in front of them, moved around to behind them. The pillar of cloud moved at, from the front and stood behind them. And the cloud settled between the Egyptian and the Israelite camps. And a darkness fell. And the cloud turned to fire. See what God is doing? Can you even imagine the emotion in this? The fear? And then the elation? And then Moses stands up and and calls on God and God parts the Red Sea? Can you imagine the hope all of a sudden? What happens here as we follow it? As we follow the story, we get to chapter 16. And very quickly here, in the evening, verse 12, in the evening you will have meat to eat, and in the morning you will have all the bread you want. Then you will know that I am the Lord. In that evening, vast numbers of quail flew in and covered the camp. These folks who saw God do all of these phenomenal miracles, who led them every single day, as soon as they get out there, their comments were, would you bring us out here to die? Take us back to Egypt where we had food every day. God answers with a phenomenal miracle. Meat every night. Quail flew in, covered the camp. Bread every morning. And all they did was grumble. We continue the story on. Uh, I, I missed the verse I wanted to read. If, if only the Lord had killed us back in Egypt, they moaned. There we sat around with pots filled with meat and ate all the bread we wanted. But now you've brought us out here into the wilderness to starve to death? Chapter 17. Verse 2, so once more the people complained. They're tormented by thirst. It says in verse 3, they continued to argue with Moses. Why did you bring us out of Egypt? To try to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So God brings them water. Over and over and over as you follow this story, they whined and they grumbled and they complained and they looked at everything with cynicism and pessimism. And God continued 
to bless them and to meet them there over and over. What makes somebody grumble like that? What happened? So, so they began to see everything uh, through pessimistic eyes, through cynical eyes, and grumbling instead of hope and the promise of God. Folks, the things that they saw God do. Luis preached this sermon five times, at least. Here's what he said each time as he challenged the pastors. Leave the past in the past. Whether it was good past or bad past, leave the past in, in the past. God is doing something entirely new here. It will be even better. And the gospel is a gospel of hope. The good news is hope. So, friends, either every single day God's mercies are brand new, or they're not. Every day, God's provision is either new or it's not, or it's a thing of the past. Every day, God's work is always new, or we sit around and long for the way it used to be. Then, as we continue through that story in the Old Testament, we come to Joshua 40 years later. And they're back at the, Red sea, at the Jordan River where they were 40 years ago. It's a new generation of God's people. They're right back where they were. They're facing the Jordan River at flood stage. It's not a trickling little creek. This is a swollen, flooded, uh, raging river right now. And God says to them, pick up the Ark of the Covenant, your most prized possession, and walk into the water. And when you get knee deep or waist deep, then I'll roll back the water. Of course not, no. No, 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 right? That's not how God does that miracle. Don't you remember? Forty years earlier, uh, God's huge miracle, the wall of fire behind them and dry passageway through the water in front of them. But this time, pick up your most prized possession and wade into the raging water. Not a chance, too much risk. We're afraid don't you remember the Red Sea? This is the Ark of the Covenant we're talking about here. Same miracle, but God asked his people to take a completely different posture and approach. And we don't like that. At least most of us don't. Maybe this next generation needed to be, to, to, to be pushed to step into faith before God did something. The previous generation actually were shaking in fear as the enemy pursued them, and they probably ran through the Red Sea as fast as they could to get to the other side, and once everything was done, then they celebrated how great God was, and then started complaining right away. This next generation could smell the promises of God, and they ran towards them with eagerness and with hope and with energy, you see the difference between cynicism and hope? Which response describes you personally? Response A, even when God's got a wall of fire surrounding you and an open waterway ahead of you, we can find something to complain about. This isn't going to turn out well. Even when God provides meat and, and bread daily, we can find something to grumble about. Because that, you know what, that's some of us. Maybe it's all of us at some times. Response B is, as in Joshua chapter 3 verse 5 says, consecrate yourselves because tomorrow God's going to do something amazing. Let's run towards that. Yes, there's risk. Yes, there's unknown. Yes, there's fear. But there's hope. Hope because they're sure and secure in their God and his promises. I think every one of us, regardless of our age, falls into this trap. Chances are when we were kids, we defaulted to hope. Chances are the older we get, we default to something cynical. So Luis challenged his church in Cuba to leave the past 
in the past and get ready to move forward with hope to what God is going to do because God hasn't changed. Whatever that looks like, however that is, wherever that takes us, be ready to follow. Here's the thing. Nobody sets out in life with the pursuit of cynicism. No college graduate graduates with the plan of being skeptical, pessimistic, and ending up cynical. Nobody does. We all uh, look at it with optimism and idealism. We enter the world with hope. The problem is we get hurt. Things don't go the way we expected. And over time, we lose that hope. And we settle for second best. And we become skeptical about anything good. And it sneaks up on us. This, this is why I wanted to call this series Curveballs. Because we don't see it coming. It looks like it's coming straight down the middle and all of a sudden it's curved and, and I didn't see it coming. How did I get like this? It snuck up on me. I don't like that I'm like this. I don't want to be a cynic. Do you? Let me say this clearly. Hope is the opposite of cynicism. We can't have cynicism and hope. They're opposites. Back to 1 Thessalonians and the church we were visiting there. Verse 4 gave us those three things. Faithfulness and loving deeds and enduring hope. In verse 6, talked about the severe difficulty that, were, that they were in. But, but knowing their hope. And known around the world for their hope. That's a church that's a beacon of hope in the midst of their suffering. Let me be blunt. If you are cynical, then you're not a beacon of hope. Because you know people that are cynical. Don't think that you are a beacon of hope to the world if you are cynical and pessimistic. Because they don't go together. Folks, I want us to be overflowing with hope. So how do we live up to our motto? How do, how do we grow into our motto? The gospel of Jesus Christ is about hope. Do you ever see a hint of pessimism in Jesus' life? Do you ever see Jesus being cynical? Everything about Jesus is about hope. And it means I can know and I can experience and I can live like that old hymn. Every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. Folks, if your days with Jesus were sweeter before, then we have a problem. Hope brings energy and joy and passion and excitement and action and movement. Where does hope start? Do you want to know? Flip over to Colossians. It's just a page or two before where we are in 1 Thessalonians. Colossians chapter 1. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 27, he's talking about the great mystery that has now been revealed that Christ in you is what? The hope of glory. Christ in you is the hope of because I know Jesus. I know Jesus lived and he died and he rose again. He is alive and active in this world. And Christ is alive in you. That equals hope. If he is alive in you, then, then there's more and more and more and more of Jesus and less and less and less of me. More and more and more of Jesus, less and less and less of you. And when you all walk into a room, people see Jesus. Folks, that's Christ in you. He is possessing you. He is filling you. Christ in you equals hope. And this is so personal. This has got nothing to do with your wife or your husband. This has nothing to do with, with, some, with somebody that taught. Nothing to do with me. This is you and Christ in you. 
If we were to be a beacon of hope on the shores of Lake Huron, it starts with each one of us, intimate with God. This is the most intimate place of our lives, the most intimate place and intimacy with our Savior. If we want to be hopeful, optimistic, full of excitement and curiosity and action and energy, it starts with intimacy with God. Now, I was taught for a long time, it's me and Jesus, and we're going to do life together, and he is by my side. Folks, that's not Christianity. Christianity is Jesus in you. He is alive in you, and he's changing you. It doesn't start with perfect attendance at Bible study. It starts with Christ alive in you. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 19 That verse talks about hope. Actually, most of Hebrews 6 talks about hope. But that verse says, Hold fast to the hope that is set before you. That hope is sure and steadfast for the soul. It leads us behind the curtain. Now, there's an Old Testament reference. In the temple, there was the area where everybody could go. There was the area where all the priests can go. Then there was the area where only God can go. And there was a curtain there. And when the priest went in once a year to deal with stuff, they tied a rope around him in case he died when he was in there because you couldn't go in there. What happened when Jesus died on the cross? That curtain was ripped open. Folks, listen. Hope takes you into the inner sanctuary of God, the most intimate place of God. And hope are connected in that verse, hope sets you, the hope set before you takes you into God's most intimate place. That's what he wants for you. Now, some of you are being cynical about that right now. Hope isn't just wishful thinking. Hope is based on fact and truth and knowing. Okay, there was a lot of years that, that, that I wished the Maple Leafs would win the Stanley Cup again. But there comes a time that maybe when they have the right players in place and the right structure in place, that the truth of that, now there is hope. The changes from wish to hope, and it's based on reality. It's not based on just wishing. Folks, hope in Christ The hope we're talking about today isn't a wish. It's based on reality, truth, and an unchanging God. And is that hope oozing out of you 24-7, whether we're thinking about it or not? That's a beacon of hope. As we, as a church, listen to God and do what he says, as we pursue his direction together, as you, as individuals, listen to God and do what he says, as we pursue intimacy with God, not just friendship with God, but intimacy with God, as we are full of Jesus and live that way every moment, guess what? People will see. People will know. People will watch. That's the church in First Thessalonians. That's what's happening in Cuba. This church in 1 Thessalonians, as it says, all of the people in Macedonia and Achaia are talking about this. It says, your life changed, the way you've changed from following the Greek gods and the mythology to now your allegiance with Jesus. He said, everyone, the world is talking about that. We saw that in Cuba, and that's my dream for us. Individuals, so full of Jesus that when we get together, the world notices. And in a world that's progressively dark, progressively cynical, progressively pessimistic, and where hope has vanished, folks, we need a beacon of hope. That's my dream for us. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we need you because 
and maybe I could just speak for myself, I tend to lean towards cynicism. And when I see something new, and I've got experience, or I've been hurt, or it's been great before, something new is on the horizon, uh, we're just often way too cynical and pessimistic. And we drag our feet and we're sluggish. Father, fill us with hope. May hope just ooze from us day in and day out that the world would see that you are alive and well, that you are in us. And when we walk in a room, people see Jesus and hear Jesus and smell Jesus and are curious. God, when we get together and we're like that all together, the world will know. So Father, fill us with hope as we know you more and more and more, as we know God. Change us to become more and more and more like Jesus. That through that, the world around us changes. Do your work in us. Convict us, shake us, fill us with hope. In Jesus' name, amen.